Um, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to Envy Smart, um, at our different time this, this week at 10 a.m. My name is Brad Clark. I'm an academic from the University of Melbourne and um, the, uh, the Australian Laboratory for Emerging Contaminants. I'll start off by um, acknowledgement of country. We'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we uh, meet today and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, Envy Smart is it's run by us here at the University of Melbourne um, at ALEC, but we also we've been supported by um, some uh, Agilent and Eurofins. Um, we've partnered with other uh, professional organisations like um, the Australian Contaminated Land Consultants Association, Water Research Australia, and also CTAC. And then we also have some sponsors with Trajan and PM Separation. So. Um, encourage you to become a member of them, those organisations if you can, and support those businesses. Um, it, we have a great program for the rest of the year as well, already set up. Um, next month, actually, we've got Jenny Storber from the CSIRO talking about um, deep sea mine tailings. That's actually going to be a face or a hybrid event. Um, yeah. A hybrid event where we're actually going to run it um, face to face on campus at the University of Melbourne, and you can also just log on through Zoom as well. So if you'd like to to join, you uh, you, you certainly may. And I think CTAC Victoria will be running um, uh, something attached to it after as well, maybe with some drinks as well. But um, that branch will let you know soon as well. And then in August and um, September we have some we're going to have a bit of plastics research being presented by um, the amazing Jen Labors from the University of Tasmania and Kevin Tom, uh, Professor Kevin Thomas from the University of Queensland. They're both doing some really um, great stuff in the plastics world. But without further ado, today we are I'm very pleased that Michelle can join, um, join us all the way from California. So very, very much appreciate that. Uh, Michelle is a research chemist who has been in the USGS uh, California Water Science Center since 2005. She has a, a BA in chemistry from Vassar College and a PhD in environmental engineering from John Hopkins University. Her research focuses on the fate, transport and effects of current use pesticides and other organic contaminants in aquatic and terrestrial environments. She directs a laboratory that focuses on the analysis of organic contaminants at trace concentrations in a wide variety of matrices. Thanks Michelle for joining us. Um, after work hours, we appreciate it very much. All right, let me get my slides up. Oh, can you see those? Sure can, I can hear you fine. All right, thank you. Well, Brad, I wanna really appreciate you for inviting me. I, um, while this is virtual, I do welcome the chance to talk to a international audience um, about some of the research we're doing. Um, so I'm gonna be focusing on today on uh, neonicotinoid insecticides. Um, they've been in the news a lot. Um, for various reasons, um, pollinators, aquatic ecosystems. Um, so I'm gonna talk about how some of the research we've been doing, um, how that relates to kind of the greater context of these neonicotinoid insecticides. Um, before I start, I will just kind of give a little blurb about my agency, the US Geological Survey. Um, we do set in the United States in our Department of the Interior, and we are the science arm um, for any, um, kind of science, you know, activities related within the United States. So we can, the kind of an old name with the geological survey we started, we've kind of merged into other agencies, um, but really we are the scientific arm of a lot that goes on in the United States. I will also note we don't make policy so that we're just really here to provide the best data possible um, for, you know, geology, water, biology, um, a bunch of different um, disciplines. So um, as Brad said in my introduction, I run a lab and I run a research group and um, our main focus is pesticides, um, sort of the fate, transport, effects, occurrence. Um, and while you know, the vast majority of our work we do does focus on pesticides, we also um, have been into other organic contaminants. Some of them I call old agrochemicals, things such as nitrification inhibitors that have been used at least in the United States for decades. Um, they're applied with um, ammonia fertilizers to hopefully keep those fertilizers in the ammonia form. Um, we also work with herbicide safeners or compounds that are applied with herbicides but are not regulated 
like the parent herbicide. Um, and then we've also um, done some other studies with disinfection byproducts from water treatment. Um, more recently, we've gotten to quaternary ammonium compounds, so that are disinfectants, and that um, we're trying to determine if their use increased during the COVID-19 pandemic as um, they were kind of um, put on a list of things that would be good for um, wiping surfaces, cleaning your house, and those sorts of things. Um, but once again, my talk today is going to focus not just only on pesticides, but a small group of pesticides, um, the neonicotinoids. Um, we do design our projects. We have all our own in-house methods. So kind of for the studies we do, we do all our own analysis. Um, we're constantly trying to look at different matrices, small. We really specialize in small volume. For a lot of field studies, it can be hard um, for those crews to get a lot of sample. Um, so we try to work with very small sample sizes. Um, and I'm always happy to talk about analytical methods in depth if anyone ever wants to geek out with me over those, but I usually don't include them in talks, um, so I don't lose the people not interested. But we have a lot of um, GCMS, tandem GCMS, tandem LCMS, high res LC um, that um, we have going on in our labs. So we've gotten a bunch of instruments over the years. And so we not only work with other people within my own agency, the USGS, but we also work with other state agencies, federal agencies of the U.S., academia, um, just whoever we think we can partner with um, to do the best studies. Um, we are located in wonderful, sunny Sacramento, California, <laughs> um, where it is very sunny and hot today. So um, just to kind of, kind of where really my lab comes in, um, especially within the USGS, is we really try to check changing um, pesticide use, and in this case, um, changing insecticide use. It's not um, static compounds that are being used are constantly changing. Um, this could be because new pesticides are discovered. Um, there could be changing pest pressures. There might be resistance um, to those insecticides that have been applied previously. Um, and sometimes there are restrictions or concerns. Um, in, um, for instance, you know, um, I have a timeline on the bottom. You know, originally DDT was used in insecticide, and then of course. You know, it's biocumulative and long-term effects were discovered. Um, even in things like the 1990s, we had a lot of organophosphates, um, chlorpyrifos and diazinon. Then it was determined they were a water quality issue, um, especially for uh, mammals. So they were put a lot of restrictions, which caused the pyrethroid insecticides to really increase in use. Then it, um, it was determined there were a lot of um, benthic toxicities, so sediment toxicities, um, and then also so around, say, the mid-2000s, um, the neonicotinoids um, kind of came on because of um, a couple things. One was just potential you know, restrictions um, because of aquatic or sediment toxicity for other insecticides, but also, and I'm going to talk a lot more about a change in application techniques. Um, so you know, not only do the actual compounds being applied change, how they are applied can change. You can have a granular formulation or um, what kind of will be the focus of a lot today is you can do things like seed coatings. Um, so why are neonicotinoid insecticides so popular? Currently, they are the most widely used insecticides in the world. Um, they have home use. Um, there's a lot of pet flea medications that include them. A lot of lawn and garden uh, in insecticide treatments will include a neonicotinoid. And then, of course, they're used widely in agriculture um, and as I said, they're, they can be applied as granules, they can be sprayed, um, foliar sprays, aerial applications, and then the big one is that they are um, one of the main insecticides that are put on seed coatings. Um, structurally, and how they were discovered, they're similar to nicotine, um, so they are, and this is neurotoxic. Um, to insects, they are active against a broad spectrum of insects, which makes them of use to, um, for a lot of different applications. And one of the initial um, you know, good points for um, the increased use of neonics is they're not as toxic um, to vertebrates, including mammals, um, as some of the other insecticides that had been used in the past. So from you know, a human or other mammalian standpoint, um, you're seeing less toxicity um, from, these, from these insecticides than you had, say, with the, the organophosphates. Um, and what really makes the neonics kind of, you know, um, different from some of the other insecticides is they're very water soluble, so it makes them systemic, as in they can be taken up um, by the plant from the seed coating and conferred throughout the plant material. 
Um, I will note, I have a little, another little timeline at the bottom. C coatings are also not new. Um, they really date back in history, um, you know, some original, like, you know, hundreds of years ago, they looked at using chlorine or salt water to kind of um, make their seeds um, kind of more viable and get better growth from crops. Um, they've used arsenic, organomucurics. Um, fungicides have been widely used um, as seed coatings um, since the 1960s. Um, so those were kind of, you know, been applied um, to seed coatings much longer than the insecticides have. But you really see, um, once again, in this, this 2000s um, time frame of, you know, the neonics, um, imidacloprid came around in um, 1994, but then in the early 2000s, you had two other major neonicotinoids, clothianin and thiamethoxam, um, are now registered. Um, and then this just proliferation of um, seed coatings. Um, and if you've heard about neonicotinoids in the news, um, like I said, a lot of it initially, um, the, the concern over them stemmed um, from honeybee um, declines, and there was the um, colony collapse of um, disorder that was um, kind of, you know, happened around 2006, um, where these honeybee colonies had worker bees that were abruptly disappearing. Um, this, you know, I'm not going to talk a lot about honeybees. My research doesn't really focus on honeybees. Um, this is a multi-factor, multi-faceted issue. Um, with honeybees, there's also varroa mites, you know, other pathogens that could be of concern. Um, but, you know, neonicotinoids are neurotoxins to um, bees, so it's not necessarily surprising that there were potential issues, um, but there also could be a risk to other pollinators, not just honeybees, including bumblebees, native bees. Um, there's a lot of different other species, especially around where I live, um, that, you know, may also be affected even though they're not honeybees. Um, there's been a lot of concern about butterflies. So while the initial concern came with the honeybees, people have now focused on potential effects to other pollinators. Um, so this is just a kind of a nice pictorial to kind of show you, you know, how um, these neonicotinoids, especially, um, you know, because they are systemic, how they can be taken up by the plant. And this is just showing an example. Say you had a midacloprid, you had a foliar spray, you know, especially these seed treatments or seed um, soil injections, um, because they are so water soluble when the plant, as it takes up water, it can take up these insecticides with it. It will take these insecticides hopefully throughout the plant material, including you know, the pollen, the nectar, um, or any of the leaves, and then any insects visiting that plant could, could then be exposed um, to those insecticides producing the toxicity. Um, this picture, this um, little picture here shows bees. Um, and then on the right um, in the picture, you can also be like where our initial concern was is that, you know, you have these insecticides applied as seed coatings, but what kind of happens to them in an environmental context? Um, you know, initially they knew there was going to be dust from planting when you have all these coated seeds, um, but also um, since these insecticides are really water soluble, you know, where, where are they going in our water system? Um, and because even with some of the initial studies um, that were looked at, you know, how much of that mass that was applied as the seed coating, how much of it is taken up by the plant, I've seen ranges anywhere from 5 20% being the highest, usually the average is considered around 10% of that seed coating is actually taken up by the plant. So you have a lot of it um, that was actually applied on that seed is not necessarily being taken up by the plant and can either, I mean, it can be broken down in the soil or it can be, you know, um, moved off site, transport and have potential downstream effects. So um, how I kind of got into this um, research is, um, I knew that neonicotinoid use was increasing, um, especially in the United States. Um, we're showing a figure kind of of where the highest use is. Um, if you see those dark brown areas, that's where the ma majority of corn and soy um, in the Midwest of the United States is, is grown. And since initially um, a lot of these seed coatings were on corn and soybeans, it translates to that part of the um, the United States would be kind of where most of the neonicotinoids are used. Um, and if you look, um, so I've showed kind of use data um, for the three major neonicotinoids, clothanin, imiclopred, and thiamethoxam. Now this is only agricultural use. And as you can see, 
from about the mid 2000s um, up to, you know, a decade later, you're really seeing this increase um, in use of these compounds. Um, a couple of things to note, clothianidin mainly initially was used as a seed coating on corn. And so you really see um, its use increasing and only on one crop um, through time, whereas something like imidacloprid, which is used on a variety of different other crops, also sees this, use, this increase in use um, kind of in that decade from about 2005 to 2014. Now, another thing to note is that you kind of see around 2015 that these graphs drop off abruptly. Um, that is not because use decreased. Um, these, these use um, data are generated within the USGS um, by a different group than myself. But what had happened is that the company that they pay to get this use data from um, had determined that um, figuring out how many, how much of these insecticides were applied to seed coatings was just, there was too much uncertainty and they didn't feel comfortable, you know, having these data anymore. So we no longer have any sort of idea um, how many, how much of these insecticides are applied to seed coating. But really all we have is that we know that in 2015, um, they were no longer reporting it. And you can see some of these abrupt changes. So we have an estimate of what it was before um, we think it's going up, but we don't know for certain um, because we no longer have access um, to some of that data. So um, my first, you know, surface water study is one thing I was, you know, there's a lot of um, people with concern about neonicotinoids and honeybees. Like I said, um, we kind of wanted to know what were, um, you know, these were water soluble compounds. Were they getting into our streams, rivers, um, near where they applied? Um, so I targeted an area um, in the Midwest um, in Iowa and of high neonicotinoid use. Um, we detected the neonicotinoids frequently. Um, and the main thing we found here, as you look in the figure, we had kind of samples collected pre-planting, um, samples collected right after planting and then throughout the growing season. And what we found is um, these highest concentrations did occur right after planting, which leads us to note that they are coming from the seed coatings. Um, this was um, kind of a different thing for insecticides. It's long been seen um, in the United States and the Midwest. Um, they apply herbicides prior to planting. And then, right, if you get any rain events after planting, you would get what they call a spring flush of herbicides. So you would get increased herbicide concentrations in streams right after planting. Um, insecticides, historically, you would get sporadic detections perhaps throughout the summer. And what we've now changed is that we're seeing insecticide increases and peaks similar. Um, while the concentrations are not as high, we're getting a pattern that previously we had only seen um, with herbicides. And this is just noting the more kind of universal and earlier application um, of these insecticides. You know, they're meant to be prophylactic. Um, so they are applied with the seed. Um, and then we see them run off um, with, with the herbicides. Um, so we were able to demonstrate, you know, that these neonicotinoids are detected in streams. Um, we wanted to get, at least across the United States, a better idea of, is this kind of a local problem centered where there's high corn and soybean production? And we were able to tack on with another um, study that was measuring a lot of different chemicals across the U.S., but this just highlights the neonicotinoids. And basically, it says we were kind of detecting them in a lot of places. Um, urban and ag areas had detections um, for the three major neonics, um, both clothin and thymethoxin were positively correlated to row crops. So this is, in this case, um, is typically corn and soybeans. Um, Imidacloprid, we actually had a positive correlation with the percent urban area um, around the particular watershed. Um, and we are also seeing multiple neonicotinoids in the stream sample. Um, and so in one in one sample actually, which was from California, we had five neonicotinoids. I include six in my method. One is not even applied in the United States um, and it was at the highest concentration. So this was indicative to us is that this wasn't just a very regional problem. Um, we are seeing these, these um, insecticides everywhere and it's not just from seed coatings. Um, but anyway, a lot of times I talk about, you know, we measure concentrations in water, but what do they mean? you know, just because you can measure it, sometimes we can get really low detection limits. Um, is that really of concern? And so um, this was a figure I'd put together after I'd done 
um, some of my initial work in 2016. Um, and then, so in the United States, we kind of go by the United States um, EPA's benchmarks. They have a whole bunch of benchmarks for acute and chronic toxicity. And those are kind of what a lot of our stream measurements are measured against. Um, so if you look at um, those EPA levels, um, all of our samples were well below, it, below any acute level that the EPA had listed. I have the chronic um, toxicity level that the EPA had at the time. Um, we might have gotten a couple samples that were above that chronic toxicity level. Um, but at that time, they were also concerned of that these uh, insecticides could have effects on, on insects and that the EPA, um, they do their toxicity tests. They have test species, um, but for the for types of aquatic insects, it turns out that the um, test species that they use is actually pretty resistant to neonicotinoids, even though other, um, you know, invertebrates in the stream may not be. Um, and there was work, especially done by uh, Christy Morrissey's group out of Saskatchewan, um, that said that, you know, we actually, these acute and chronic toxicity levels are lower, um, orders of magnitude lower. And so if you went by those um, ones that Christy Morrissey had proposed, you know, some of our, uh, a fair amount of our ag samples were getting over those acute toxicity levels. And then in both um, ag and urban areas, we are seeing concentrations above the chronic toxicity levels. Um, but once again, I, I in the United States, we go by the EPA, but um, the EPA did um, update um, their toxicity levels, I think it was in 2018 or 19. Um, to get in line with this, they reevaluated, they looked at more data. And so, and then they also did um, drop some of their toxicity levels. And once again, um, they were a little, um, a little different than the ones I proposed, uh, that Christy Morsi proposed, but actually they're not that different. Um, and once you can, you can see that um, more in ag areas were um, above some of the acute toxicity levels, um, but we're, you know, for many of the neonics in both ag and, and, and urban areas, we are above um, those chronic toxicity levels. And this is just, uh, for me, it was an indication of, you know, it's good to measure things. It's good to know what they are and also make sure that, you know, you're changing with the context of, you know, toxicity values as more information um, becomes available, they can change. And what went from, okay, so you can measure it, you know, that's great. No, these are actually levels of concern. And there's a lot more effort now kind of put into um, what are the levels of neonicotinoids in our waterways and what might the um, long-term effects be. So also um, because the neonicotinoids were really focused on pollinators, as I said, but I was not gonna do honeybees or a bunch of people working on honeybees. Um, sometimes research happens with a phone call. I got a phone call from a colleague um, in Colorado, um, you know, not usually considered a hot area of agriculture, but he had been collecting, um, he's, you know, wildlife ecologist collects, he's been collecting bees, um, especially native wild bees um, for years. And he knew this area, um, they used, they did a lot of um, dry land wheat production. Um, and he said, I have a bunch of bees. Do you think you can measure pesticides in them? And I said, yes. Um, so we measured a whole, whole range of pesticides, not just neonics. Um, but we did find um, that we were detecting neonics in these native pollinators. We had small bees, we had larger bees like bumblebees um, in both um, the wheat fields. Um, so these were bees collected actually in wheat fields um, and then also in adjacent grasslands. Um, that were trying to be preserved for habitat um, for pollinators. Um, and this was kind of one of the first things, um, kind of research into, you know, this is a concern, these neonicotinoids, you know, and other pesticides, not just for honeybees, but there's also this whole host of other um, wild and native pollinators um, that could be exposed. And we don't know a lot about um, how the effects might be. Um, toxicity tests for these pesticides are run with honeybees. So we know the toxicity levels for honeybees. Um, we don't always know, you know, the toxicity values um, for some of these other bee species. Um, and so these were some of my initial projects. And so some of our more recent ones, um, they are still kind of spanning this whole kind of thing of the next one is how does the type of application, how does, what is the effect that has on runoff? 
um, what affects might there be on non-target organisms. I try to collaborate with people doing both lab and field studies, and then just sort of this larger understanding of neonicotinoids in waters. Um, this is just California, actually has a fantastic pesticide use. They do a lot of pesticide use tracking, um, way more than any other place in the United States. And so you can see, um, once again, as I talk about, you know, this, you know, around 2000 to 2015, you do see an increase um, in, in the neonicotinoids. And once again, you see that um, increase in use in California, um, and you're also seeing this decrease um, in the organophosphates um, and somewhat of a decrease in pyrethroids. Um, so we are all also seeing that in California. Um, I will note that this pesticide use does not include seed coatings um, because that's not included um, in their tracking. Um, and this was just, um, we did a bunch of um, California waterways. As I noted from my previous study, our one site in California had five neonics in a sample, which I had not typically seen and some of the highest concentrations. And once again, we were seeing, you know, fairly high concentrations on the orders of, you know, orders of magnitude what we'd seen in other areas. And some of these drains we were seeing, especially in some of these ag drains along the central coast, which grows a lot of lettuce and berries and um, types of crops that you don't normally see in some of the air, other areas we've studied. Um, we're seeing frequent detections, but also um, in an urban area, although the concentrations tended to vary. But once again, like I said, we're getting these frequent detections on multiple, multiple neonicotinoids. Um, and then the figure on the bottom right is actually showing um, that a lot of these um, were exceeding um, some of these aquatic life benchmarks. So they were at concentrations of concern. Um, and this led us to, like I said, the California um, pesticide use database, fantastic, but it does not include seed treatment. And they were seeing higher concentrations in some of those um, central coast areas of California than we would expected when looking at the pesticide use data, but we realized they weren't tracking seed treatment. And we've just realized they've been treating, you know, like I said, a lot of the initial seed coating started with corn, soy, canola was a big one. Um, they've done wheat, but now in California, we knew they were using lettuce seeds um, that were planted with the seed treatment. Um, one of the other ways that they also um, tend to apply insecticides um, to lettuce is with a drench. So they drench along the furrows. Um, so we actually had a great comparison study on an ag, ag, ag research farm. Um, where they um, a planted, we planted lettuce seeds that had imidacloprid, or they planted the seeds in an imidacloprid drench. We also had an imidacloprid seed coating and a clothiodin seed coating, and we're actually able to compare it to the uncoated seed. Um, and so we, in this case, kind of had, well, um, the drench um, is applied at, at higher concentrations or higher masses um, than the seed coating. We were able to at least directly compare um, the same um, insecticide that for both of them. And we were actually seeing higher concentrations of the runoff water from the trench um, than from the seed coating. Um, and so this is kind of just another way, um, one, we can actually look at, you know, how does the application technique change potential runoff? How are those effects? And in this case, um, it looks that like, well, there's a lot of variability um, just from these sites. Um, that in this case, you know, the seed coating might actually lead um, to less runoff than the drench. Um, as I noted, other pollinators um, that are of concern besides um, bees are butterflies. Um, we are very concerned about the monarch butterflies and they make their trek um, from Mexico all the way up through the U.S. towards Canada. Um, and since the milkweed, the milkweed is kind of the prime plant. Um, that the monarch butterflies, especially their larvae, are, need to grow on. Um, there's concern that in areas of high agriculture, they would plant the field margins with milkweed, but then there became a concern if these um, ag areas have a lot of seed coated, are these milkweed plants potentially taking up some of those neonicotinoids that are in the ground, and could they be exposing um, the monarchs? Um, so this was a kind of a greenhouse-based study with a great collaborator. Um, and he was, he actually dosed the soil um, of his milkweed plants with clopanidin, and we were able to come up um, with LD50s or LC50s um, of what, what the concentration in the leaves was to actually show um, 
lethal and sublethal effects um, to the monarch butterflies. And we looked at residues um, in the soil, the leaves, the larvae of the monarch, and actually the adult monarchs. And we were actually finding um, at high enough concentrations, the residue actually went from, um, stayed through the larvae um, as it metamorphed um, into the adult monarchs. Um, so we actually finally had some values because we didn't know these before, is, you know, what, what is that concentration of leaves that can cause effects in the monarchs, but um, not shown in this, at least I'm happy to report of all the actual milkweed I've measured that was collected from field margins has way lower concentrations um, than these LC50 values. Um, so while the clothiodidin has the ability to be taken up into the milkweed um, and the monarchs could be exposed, what we've seen thus far um, with actual field measurements is that we're below those values. Um, another one we were able to do um, is there's it's concern um, that while they're planting these seeds, um, there could be seed spills and um, you know the potential for birds um, to see these seeds that are spilt and they have insecticides all over them. Um, you know, kind of what might the implications be. Um, there's been some some reports that people have found that birds um, will start feeding on these seeds. Others have reported the birds might eat a few seeds, but then they might kind of um, be sickened by them and stop eating them. Um, but one of the things we also wanted to do was, you know, if these birds um, eat these treated seeds, kind of what are the toxicokinetics of these? So I had a postdoc um, and he collaborated with some others and they um, took Japanese quail and they they actually, you know, fed them at different um, doses and looked at kind of the um, the metal the metabolism of these neonicotinoids within the bird and the potential effects, um, even at you know, basically dosing these birds with if they ate nothing but these treated wheat seeds, um, we didn't see a lot of effects. We looked at the metabolism and found that these birds were able um, to rapidly um, metabolize these compounds. Um, plasma and liver tended to have higher concentrations um, than the brain, kidney, or muscle. Um, we also noted that a lot of, um, especially for metoclopred, the insecticide, um, it was found in the fecal material, which notes that these um, birds can eliminate these water-soluble compounds quite quickly, um, but that also knowing, you know, that fecal matter is actually a an okay way to measure these because um, we're always looking for non-lethal ways to non-lethally measure potential exposure um, that um, fecal material from birds could be something we use in the future. I'll also note in this study I don't talk about a lot is um, these seeds not only had the neonicotinoid, but they also came with the one to five fungicides um, that are usually on the treated seeds, typically at much lower concentrations. Um, than the insecticide. And we are seeing far fewer of the um, fungicides in any of the uh, biological compartments that we measured. Um, kind of um, back to pollinators and doing a field study. Um, and this one was local and right nearby where I live. There's a lot of ag, but it's very interspersed. You'll see um, kind of ag areas. And then they've also planted hedgerows. Um, between these ag fields and they have shown over years that if you plant these hedgerows with just a bunch of different plants that it really increases um, the number of pollinators, the diversity of pollinators. But once again, we had the question if, you know, we have these hedgerows, we're really meant to be pollinator attractants, but we also know that there's all this ag going on in the area. In this case, it's rice, almonds, walnuts, tomatoes. What kind of pesticide exposures are these pollinators seeing? And is it enough to cause, you know, potential effects? What, what like, like I said, are they even being exposed to it? Um, because, you know, we know this is good habitat just, you know, from a numbers and a diversity standpoint, but um, what is it from the pesticide um, realm? So we actually were also able to measure a lot of major seas. We had um, kind of silicone bands as passive samplers for air. We looked at soil, we looked at flower and nectar. We looked at some native bees, we looked at honeybees, just to kind of look at, you know, what are the differences? Um, we were actually able to um, measure a whole range of pesticides. Um, and we did get pretty good overlap between all the matrices, which was good. Um, we really liked being able to use the silicone bands as passive samplers because they are cheap and really easy to install um, versus say, <laughs> um, you know, someone out there trying to collect pollen and nectar um, from various different species. 
or various different um, plant species um, and also collecting bees. Um, we did find there were um, some differences in what residues we were finding in honeybees versus the native bees. And that could be because the honeybees typically travel a little further than some of the native bees. Um, one of the things also we noticed is that a lot of the pesticides we weren't detect we were detecting weren't necessarily applied to the field right next to um, the, the where we were sampling, but were coming from aerial spraying of rice, which wasn't even happening nearby, um, which just also made us remember that we some we need to look at things not just on a field scale, but in certain instances we need to look at things on a landscape scale. Um, and in this case, um, for the insecticides we detected, um, they're not using a lot of treated seeds in this area. Um, we are detecting more of like the pyrethroid bifenthrin. Um, we still detected the organophosphate for pyrifos. Um, we had some detections of imidacloprid, but not as much. Um, and so not only did the study allow us to look at different matrices, but it also, like I said, not only in my lab, we always try to do this kind of broad scan for pesticides, um, is that a lot of people were kind of just really focusing on neonicotinoids. And we always like to make sure that we include everything because depending on the, you know, where you're at, um, if you limit yourself to a certain group of pesticides, you may not be um, getting the whole picture. Um, we also did some sunflower work. So these were actually paired fields. Um, once again, we were able to do kind of like the lettuce study where we had fields um, that were had treated seeds. Um, they had a thiamethoxum seed coating, and then we had um, comparable sunflower fields next to it that just had an uncoated um, seed. And for this study, it was really interesting. We um, rarely detected thiamethoxum um, in any of the bees. We um, also looked at honey and nectar um, from some of these sunflowers. And so it appears that the even though these sunflower seeds are coated with thiamethoxum, um, a lot of that thiamethoxum is not really making it to the pollen and nectar or to the bees um, that we're visiting these plants, um, which is, is good from a standpoint. I do question then if that thiamethoxum is uh, conferring much insecticidal activity as it was intended to do. And in this study, we didn't measure any water runoff. This was a very pollinator focused study. Um, but once again, it kind of highlights the need to really look at you know, how pesticides are applied um, and their techniques, and you can't just make one statement for all crops. You know, different crops vary um, by the plants and their irrigation regimes and just how they might grow and what effects might happen. Um, also kind of want to, um, in this kind of on some of the work we're doing right now and some of the additional potential downsides of um, treated seeds right now in the United States, um, treated seeds are not regulated. Um, from um, the Environmental Protection Agency like aerial applications are. Um, they are classified differently. They're classified as treated articles, say if you would treat wood or something. Um, so they don't undergo the same regulations. Um, and there was an ethanol plant um, in Nebraska in the Midwest of the US that decided they would accept these coated seeds um, for ethanol production. Um, it was actually a cogeneration ethanol um, like biogas production. Um, and you can see from the pictures, basically they accepted sort of like, because it's hard to dispose of some of these treated seeds, not everyone will take them. So they actually were accepting them from all across the country. You can see by these bright colors, um, but it's really led um, because so many of these treated seeds were kind of concentrated in one area. It's kind of led to unprecedented concentrations in water. I mean, I'm talking about orders of magnitude more than I've seen anywhere else with any of my other um, studies. Um, it was really, it was really started, um, there was a professor at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and she actually, you know, does research with honeybees. And she kind of took this job and she took over someone else's honeybee colonies and she could not keep them alive. And it, you know, it really led her to go back to this um, plant that was accepting treated seeds that it actually just started recently and enough dust um, and other like runoff from this plant um, was able to cause it so that, you know, where she was, she was unable to keep her honeybees alive. Um, so after a lot of spills and unknowns, the plant is currently shut down, um, but the environmental impact and the long-term environmental impact is unknown. Um, 
while this is obviously not something we want to happen, it also does give us a chance to kind of study a unique situation um, where concentrations are this high and what are they going to look like? Um, how quickly are they going to go down um, over the next years? There are still um, ponds of wastewater um, that they're trying to figure out what to do with. There are these stacks of um, distiller's grain or wet cake. So it was the processed seeds for ethanol and it's what's left afterwards and it's still really high in pesticides. Um, but we are supporting some of our University of Nebraska colleagues and measuring uh, bird eggs and um, just looking at different effects of aquatic insects in addition to water and sediment. Um, and just kind of like, well, you know, what happens that, you know, the neonicotinoids are coming under pressure, but like I said, pesticide use is always changing, um, you know, kind of what's next. Um, once again, taken to the California database, um, there's kind of more different insecticides. There's always some, one of the um, ones I've seen a lot, especially used on seed coatings is chlorantranilopril. It's a diameter insecticide. You can see in California, it's use is starting to creep up. Um, maybe some neonic use is going down. And this has been an insecticide that we've kept in our, our methods um, for some time since we knew it had been registered. And that helps us not only track, you know, where they are in water and sediment and in the environmental transport um, to hopefully get some idea of, you know, where to continue to look as its use increases. Um, and just one more thing on seed treatment. Um, I really focused on the neonicotinoids. As I said, usually seeds um, have one insecticide and then one to five fungicides per seed coating, depending on the seed. Um, fungicide use tends to change more than insecticides. You tend to get more variety. Um, the fungicides have a greater range of hydrophobicity. Um, some are quite water soluble like the neonics. Some are a little more hydrophobic, so that changes their environmental transport. And I just put together a quick thing of seeds that my lab has received um, for dosing studies or people are just doing studies um, and kind of in order. And you can see um, I highlighted the insecticides in yellow and the fungicides are all in the green columns. Um, but one of the more recent things we found is that we were sent some wheat and canola, but the canola, we thought it was treated with one insecticide and a group of fungicides, and it was, but it turns out it's double treated it like has a whole regime of another insecticide and fungicide. So this was the first time we saw two insecticides and seven fungicides on a seed. So it seems that the current thinking is to put more um, pesticides on a particular seed, um, which is something we had not um, encountered um, previous to this. We just kind of, the one insecticide plus one to five fungicides, and now it appears like it's like they're taking groups, two groups, and, and putting them both on the same seed. Um, so just to kind of do a quick summary, um, you know, neonics are frequently detected in aquatic and terrestrial e ecosystems. They are definitely, um, especially in aquatic areas, levels of chronic toxicity, and sometimes we can even um, find them at levels that are of concern for acute toxicity. Um, you know, the effects are mostly um, focus on aquatic invertebrates and insects, such as pollinators. I did say at the beginning, you know, they have a lower mammalian toxicity, although there is not a lot of data um, on mammalian exposures, including humans, and there are people um, that are currently working on that. Um, you know, these neonics can be transported to streams, um, especially seed coating use and then the precipitation, so runoff events are really the big drivers, um, but you'll find them in both ag and urban areas. So it's not like a, a specific land use um, that is only affected. Concentrations do tend to be higher in um, agricultural areas. Um, seed treatments are increasing overall. Like I said, when I started out, corn, soybeans, canola were kind of the big ones, but now um, pretty much any seed you can plant um, can come with a seed coating. And the other part is that um, the farmers who would like to not plant with seed like would maybe like to try to plant with untreated seeds, it is very difficult um, for them to get those, especially if they don't pre-order or find someone ahead of time. Um, and, you know, um, as I said, this focus was on just one class of insecticides, but we all know that these chemicals kind of, there's not just only a couple, there's other pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and in a lot of these areas, you know, you've got 
other chemicals too, like pharmaceuticals, personal care products, potential heavy metals. And so we always need to remember um, to consider these kind of in this greater chemical context and not necessarily just focus on one class of chemicals. So with that, I would like to thank, um, I have an amazing group, um, a research group. Um, all those people on the top line have been with me from anywhere from before I started the USGS to a couple years ago. Um, and they're just a great lab and field team. And also um, just, um, I recently have a new postdoc, um, Gabby Black, who we recently got a high res Orbitrat mass spec and she's gonna be doing lots of great things on it so we can do more in the pesticide world and with other chemicals. And um, Emily Woodward was a previous postdoc and researcher. Um, she did a lot on that lettuce study. Um, I also had an intern, a graduate intern who came to work with us for six months. And um, I think she learned a lot um, and she had a great time. She got to ride around in boats and go sampling, which she normally didn't get to do in the lab. So happy to take questions. Well, thanks so much, Michelle. That was, that was really fantastic.